states to turn its attention back to the troubled nation. In order to comprehend why Turkey is considering this invasion into Syria at this time and the potential effects it will have on the war, you must first understand why Turkey is considering this invasion into Syria now. When you look at an ethnic map of the nation, you will see that the Turks are the majority almost everywhere, with the exception of the entire southeastern corner, which is demographically dominated instead by the Kurds, an Iranian ethnic group that speaks their own distinct language and constitutes the largest linguistic and ethnic minority in Turkey. There are currently about 15 million of them living in Turkey, which equals about a fifth of the entire population. The Kurds are one of the largest nations in the world without their own state as they are spread across the borders of northern Iraq, western Iran, and four different countries. Because of this, there have occasionally been nationalist calls in the Kurdish region of this country to establish the state that would theoretically be known as Kurdistan, but Turkey opposes this. Syria for the very simple reason that if any one group of Turkish Syrian Iraqi or Iranian Kurds ever managed to achieve independence or autonomy it could end up causing a cascading domino effect that would unite all of the other Kurdish regions into that single state of Kurdistan, if for example the Kurds in Syria managed to achieve independence, Iraq and Iran have all brutally suppressed these Kurdish calls for statehood over various different times over the past century. As a result, Turkey has oppressed the Kurdish population inside its boundaries for for a century, Kurds weren't even recognized as a distinct ethnicity from Turks until 1991. Since 1980, the Kurdish language has been officially outlawed in public and private life. As a result of this repression, it is still illegal in Turkey to use the Kurdish language as a language of instruction in both public and private schools. It is only permitted to be taught as a subject. The words Kurds in Kurdistan have previously been banned in any lane language in the country. The Kurdish regions of southeast Turkey have historically engaged in movement for greater autonomy from the government or outright independence, supported by both non-violent demonstrators and armed guerrilla warfare and terrorist assaults. The Kurdistan Workers' Party, better known as the PKK, eventually emerged as the most prominent and violent of the Kurdish separatist forces to emerge in Turkey. In 1884, the PKK declared a Kurdish uprising against the Turkish government and launched a full-scale insurgency campaign. Over the decades that followed, the PKK expanded their operations and the fight against the Turkish state into the Kurdish-majority areas of Iraq and Syria, employing more than 40,000 people. Turkish incursions to attack PKK bases and operations in the Kurdish-majority areas of neighboring Iraq and Syria have been common, but for the most part, the Arab governments in Iraq and Syria each repressed their Kurdish populations as well, so they didn't necessarily mind the Turkish incursions into their territories attacking the PKK. Turkey has suffered up to $450 billion in estimated economic losses fighting against them. In defiance of the US and the rest of NATO, Turkey asserts that the SDF in northern Syria and the PKK in southeast Turkey are identical and share the same ultimate goal of creating a unified state of Kurdistan and stabilizing Turkey. By attributing responsibility for the most recent terrorist attack in Istanbul to the PKK and the SDF, Erdogan has gained the Casas ballet he needs to conduct the invasion and create his desired safe haven. Inflation in Turkey is now over 85%, the highest it has been since the 1990s, and just a few years ago in 2019, the euro was still worth 6 Turkish lira. Now, it is worth about 20. Ahead of the upcoming Turkish presidential election in June, many Turkish nationalists have long called for the deportation of the Syrian refugees from the country. This has not improved their plight. In May, President Erdogan stated that he would voluntarily return 1 million refugees to Syria. However, some of his political rivals in the upcoming election have insisted on going even further. For example, this man claims that he will deport all 3.6 million refugees back to Syria within two years of taking office, and this man claims that he will do it within one year. Sending millions of people back to a chaotic, war-torn nation where they don't feel safe is obviously a recipe for disaster, which is why the Turkish government's plan is to simply resettle them all instead into the proposed 30-kilometer wide safe zone that is the primary objective of the next invasion. However, resettling millions of people into a war-torn nation where they don't feel safe going back to is obviously a recipe for disaster. 
Washington has always had a primary interest in stopping the rise of ISIS as effectively as it can, which shocked the world in 2014 when it suddenly took control of nearly a third of Syria in a blitzkrieg-style offensive. The United States then started a targeted bombing campaign of ISIS targets from the air while they started to heavily supply the Kurdish factions in the SDF in northeast Syria with weapons and advisors to fight a parallel war against ISIS. However, the US was unprepared for how severely this approach would backfire and alienate one of its other friends. A bomb went off on November 13, 2022, in a busy retail district of Istanbul, the biggest city in Turkey. Despite each of them claiming they had nothing to do with it, the Turkish government unilaterally blamed the Kurdish separatist groups known as the PKK and SDF operating in Turkey and Syria within 24 hours of the attack. Within a week of the attack, Turkish jets and artillery systems started bombing PKK and SDF positions across northern Syria and Iraq in a campaign of retaliation. The brutal civil war in Syria has continued for 10 years. With Turkey's impending invasion looming, the conflict appears to be entering a new and potentially even more dangerous phase than before, which could force the United. Turkey because Turkey insists that the SDF and the PKK are essentially the same organization, American weapons and training for the SDF would eventually be used by the PKK against the Turkish government and their ongoing insurgency in southeast Turkey. In contrast, the US recognizes the PKK as a terrorist organization just like Turkey does, but they insist that the PKK is not a terrorist organization. In response to the conflict in Ukraine, Finland and Sweden have both applied to join NATO. However, their memberships must be approved by every other NATO member, and Turkey has purposefully delayed doing so. Currently, Turkey is demanding that Sweden and Finland extradite any suspected PKK members they may have in their countries back to Turkey so they can face trial, and that Finland continue their ongoing arms embargo on Turkey, which they imposition. Thus, TARDIS allows the Russian Navy to operate in the Mediterranean independently of Russia's own bases on the Black Sea coast, which could always be theoretically contained there by NATO closing the Turkish Straits. For this reason, the Russians want to keep Assad in power. Without TARDIS, the Russian Navy would no longer be able to function in the Mediterranean with a base to repair and replenish itself at during a war with NATO. HDS's territory in Idlib is located just 35 miles from Hemamu, the main airbase that the Russian Air Force has used as its base of operations in Syria, and only 75 miles from the vital Russian naval base at Tartus, so it makes sense that Russia and the Assad regime would prefer to keep an eye on it. However, given that the Russian Air Force has been using Hemamu as its base of operations in Syria, and that the Assad regime is more inclined to support the more secular. Alawite Shia make up only about 10% of the population in Syria, while Sunnis make up over 74% of the country's population. However, the Shia Alawites have long dominated the Assad regime's government, and fellow Shia-dominated Iran needs them to stay in power so they can continue their Shia-dominated policies. Assad himself is an Alawite Shiite Muslim, and his regime has long been friendly to the world's most powerful Shia Muslim power, Iran. In order to ensure that these goals are achieved, they also want a rail corridor to extend overland through Iraq and Syria to the Syrian portion of Latakia, which, if realized, would allow Iran to export oil and gas supplies more directly to European consumers in the event that Western sanctions are ever lifted or relaxed in the future. Iran wants the support of Assad regime to stay in power and retake control from whatever Sunni rebels are left in order to maintain Shiite dominance. This includes destroying the fundamentalist Sunni faction HTS, which is arguably the last thing standing between the Assad regime and complete victory in Syria as hundreds of Russian soldiers and contractors have been redeploying to Ukraine from Syria. While the Russians were accommodating to the Turks and their interests in Syria, the Iranians most definitely are not, and they want any elements in the country that could become hostile to their own agenda purged from any future government or settlement. As a result, Iran is much bolder than the Russians were in supporting the Assad regime's restoration. Both Erdogan and Turkey are aware of the IM pending humanitarian disaster, which is probably yet another reason why they want to invade and establish their 30-kilometer deep safe zone now. If the Iranian government pushes into the last rebel stronghold in Idlib, millions more Syrians who oppose the Assad regime could suddenly become refugees, 
and instead of running across the border into Turkey, the Turks could invade Syria. All it all started back in 2009, when a discovery was made in the eastern Mediterranean that would forever alter Turkey's foreign policy. In that year, Israel discovered a number of enormous offshore natural gas deposits within their exclusive economic zone, which was quickly followed by other enormous discoveries within the ease of Cyprus and Egypt, but none were ever discovered within the unsupported, internationally recognized ease of Turkey. As a result, Turkey's foreign policy has never been the same since. Naturally, Turkey rejects this international consensus regarding its maritime borders and unilaterally insists, based on its own interpretation of international law, that its maritime borders resemble this idea known as the Blue Homeland, which may include the same types of rich natural gas deposits that have already been discovered in the waters of Cyprus, Israel, and Egypt but nowhere else in the world. Within months of signing the maritime agreement with a Tripoli-based government, the Turkish military started to send troops, mercenaries recruited from their proxies in Syria, intelligence agents, air support, and naval assets to them in order to help fight against the Tobruk-based government in the war if the Tuesday Egypt Arab states. Even though a ceasefire agreement was technically signed that ended the war more than two years ago, national elections that were previously agreed upon have been delayed numerous times and have still not taken place. Russia, France, Greece, and Israel all supported the Tobruk-based government. Many countries that are nominally allies in other theaters found themselves as enemies backing opposing sides in the Libyan civil war. However, if I made an in-depth video covering all the details of a recent major war like this, the disturbing violent and controversial details of discussing the necessary context and events would cause the video to become demonetized and age-restricted, which I completely understand and sympathize with. The civil war in Libya is directly connected to Turkey's greater geopolitical ambitions and the oil and gas politics of the Middle East in the eastern Mediterranean. Every month, I add one new full-length video to this series on Nebula. Of course, this is because none of these videos would ever function on YouTube and will never be able to be viewed there due to the way that this site operates in relation to highly sensitive and controversial recent events. On the other hand, Nebula is a completely different platform devoid of an algorithm and without any ads. The best way to access Nebula and all of this amazing exclusive content is through our sponsor CuriosityStream, and with their incredible bundle deal with Nebula, it costs less than $12 a year to have full access to both websites. CuriosityStream also has some really great content that you'll enjoy, like Gallipoli 1915, a nearly hour-long professionally produced documentary. I sincerely don't know of a better streaming deal anywhere than from the ashes of the former Ottoman Empire, where you can get two streaming sites with content you'll actually watch for less than $12 a year at the current holiday sale price. What's more, subscribing will actually support countless independent educational creators. Beyond just real life lore so please make sure to do so right away by clicking the button that is here on your screen which will take you immediately to curiositystream.com real life floor to sign up or by following the link that is down in the description below and as always I really appreciate you watching and seeing this video.